Hello and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Wednesday morning room with Tim Sullivan and me, Maya Matsuoka, as your hosts and moderators. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time on Clubhouse. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning on Wednesday here in Japan. It is uh, the day before in other parts of the world, I believe. So thank you for that. And good morning or good night. Uh, we have once again... As our guest speaker today, we have Max Salmon. You know him from our previous rooms and conversations. And we're going to talk about uh, travel and tourism, inbound travel and tourism here in Japan, because the borders are open, foreign visitors are back. And we know that, uh, well, from January until now, about 1,600,000 people have visited Japan, which is, I don't know, it is just, what, one... Um, I cannot, I cannot make the calculation anyway, but it is so much uh, less than uh, Japan used to get uh, before the pandemic. However, if you have been around Tokyo or in other parts of Japan, you have noticed that uh, there are a lot of tourists um, nowadays, and obviously, you know, uh, it's very easy to spot them. However, the thing is that uh, we now have uh, the borders open. The question, though, is what happens from now on, because uh, the travel industry as a whole and the hospitality industry as well are suffering from um, a labor shortage, of course. And I'm sure that with Mac, uh, Mac, with you, it's probably a very similar thing because you're busy all the time and you need sometimes to outsource uh, your services or probably work with uh, people you have worked with before. So let's see what is going on and also what uh, you think is going to happen from now on. Without any further ado, Mac, I'm giving the mic to you. Thank you very much, uh, Maya. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, really uh, honored to be back here uh, in the uh, Japan Expert Insights Clubhouse. It's been a little while. Um, for a number of reasons. And the one reason that we're going to discuss today is that, yes, on the 11th of October, uh, the borders of Japan were finally uh, reopened to, let's just say, to a level that, that looked very similar to how things were back in 2019. So finally, something resembling visa-free access, uh, not, not vaccination or PCR-free access, but visa-free access to uh, people from uh, the majority of countries um, around the world. Uh, so for those that don't know, uh, me, my name's Mac, and I have my own travel business, which is called Maction Planet. Uh, I founded that uh, at the end of 2016, start of 2017. And for me, things were going very well uh, in 2018 and 2019. As I mentioned uh, at the very start of this, when I was chatting to Tim, uh, as a guide, I personally was guiding for 300 days of the year. Um, there are 365 days in a year, typically. I know it's early in the morning, so I thought I'd drop that in as a reminder. In 2019, so things went very well, and then unfortunately, uh, something happened that we'll, <laughs> we'll gloss over. And myself and the rest of the world's tourism industry suffered heavily. Remember, 10% of the world's GDP is linked to uh, travel and tourism, which is a huge, huge amount. And around the world, we saw the consistent story that where uh, food and drink, uh, where um, beverage industry and food related hospitality industry typically received varying levels of government support around the world, tourism did not. And that was especially the case in Japan outside of a couple of very you know, low level handouts that were given to, to people. Uh, to, uh, to all businesses and, and a, a lot of you know people living and working in Japan, uh, the tourism industry did not get any specific support, despite the fact that it's such an important contributor to the economy here uh, and the fact that it was very, very clearly damaged as a result of um, the border policy. And that tells you something, I think, a little bit about uh, the country's attitude to its borders and, and its attitude to tourism as well, which is going to crop up uh, as we talk 
uh, a bit more uh, because, you know, uh, there, are, there are some times when I use the phrase that Japan uh, wants tourism without the tourists. And I'd like you to bear that in mind as we as we talk uh, through uh, a, a few different topics today. Um, so, again, to refresh some minds for those that don't know, uh, Japan had uh, one of the tightest border policies uh, in the world uh, pretty much as soon as the pandemic kicked off. So at the start of April uh, 2020, uh, the borders were closed uh, to entry from non-Japanese citizens. Uh, so, for example, as a as a non-citizen resident, uh, which I think is going to be the case for a lot of uh, people listening to this talk today, uh, if uh, without wishing to get morbid, if your if your mother had passed away, um, you know, in the first six months of the pandemic, you were uh, you they very they were very welcome to attend the funeral, but then you couldn't come back to uh, your life in Japan. Uh, and then, of course, l thankfully, uh, that huge contravention of human rights uh, changed, uh, and we had a reasonably consistent border policy that applied to everybody in Japan. Uh, but we're still smacked of Sakoku. Sakoku is the name that's used to describe Japan's isolation from 1637 to basically 1853 until Commodore Matthew Perry sailed the fleet of black ships in and demanded that Japan open up to international trade. Um, earlier this year, uh, Kishida, the prime minister, attended a, um, uh, some meetings in the UK and told uh, a conference that he would finally uh, open Japan back up to. Uh, the world uh, in a fashion that other G7 countries had, had reached many, many months ago. Uh, he then, within the same speech, basically backtracked that and, and kind of, you know, bit his lip and said, oh, you know, what, what I meant was, you know, on our timetable. And so began the absolute farce that was the ERFS scheme. Now, ERFS uh, was a, um, a system where uh, people, business people, uh, or uh, tourists who could enter on package tours applied for basically a certificate that was issued by a kind of guarantor in Japan, and this allowed you to then to then come here. So, like I say, for business business people, you know, companies could issue one of these things. Uh, but for uh, tourists, you had to be a you know a, a company, and uh, you know these people these tourists coming in uh, before the eleventh of October needed to basically do package tours around the country. So that's why some of you who may be unfamiliar with the logistics of it all will have seen uh, foreign faces increasing in Japan out and about on the streets of Tokyo from around about July. And then finally, with three weeks notice in September, it was announced that the borders would be reopening on the 11th of October. And uh, uh it, it was kind of interesting for me that the, the decision was was suddenly made um first of all the erfs system was uh, was an absolute farce uh it was bad for the it was bad for the industry here um it was clearly designed by some of the large travel businesses in japan uh, mentioning no names uh, jtb uh, who the government turned to for advice on on how what to do regarding you know some kind of phased reopening um, it was very, very impractical for small operators to to navigate. And it was hugely time consuming and ridiculous for um, the consumer and the travelers who had basically to receive one of these and then to jump through various form filling hoops and then to apply for a visa you know, at their uh, local embassy or consulate. Um, this involved a number of consulates being hugely overworked, um, a lot of mistakes being made. Uh, but uh, yeah, thankfully, that, that, that was all scrapped and uh, the country is now back in business, as it were, as of the 11th of October. So anyway, I just wanted to set the scene uh, because it's important to understand where we've come from uh, and how the dynamics of the past three years, I think, are playing into you know, tourism in Japan now and then uh, travel uh, going forward in 2023 and beyond. Um, so, Maya, that's a little introduction. Uh, how do you want me to do you want me to just continue uh, talking about how things are at the moment or, or uh, do you want to ask some questions? 
Oh, thank you, Mac. Yes, thank you for that run up because uh, it is important. I believe that uh, yes, for some people, uh, yeah, it's it's really helpful to get uh, a sense of uh, what is going on here in Japan. So, um, yeah, let's continue now, and we can uh, uh, actually proceed with, com- with the conversation later. Okay, fantastic. So. Um, let's look at how the recovery has taken, you know, how, what, how that's shaped up. Uh, Maya, you know, in your introduction, you mentioned that uh, to the to the uh, naked eye, you know, uh, Tokyo looks certainly, and, and Kyoto, uh, where I was very recently, very much look like uh, things are, are, are back in terms of foreign faces on the trains and at the various tourist sites uh, in Japan. And uh, the numbers for tourism in, in October came out. And October, they're they're always published in this ridiculous way, by the way. You know, this uh, you quoted a figure, right? One point six million people and and, and stuff. It, 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 absolute nonsense. You know, I've seen numbers that talk about October 2022 being, you know, a 20,000 percent increase over the previous year. I mean, just th- th- these people clearly did not have careers as um, as, as analysts. <laughs> right. Uh, but basically, the, the way the way to really think about it is that October 2022, in terms of just raw tourism numbers, was 20% of October 2019. Now, in in 2019, overall, we had 31.8 million visitors to Japan. And the majority of them, uh, I've seen various numbers, nine or nine and a half million, uh, came from China, and roughly about eight million came from Korea. So if you adjust for the fact that uh, obviously China has its own um, border issues currently, then, you know, we've seen October uh, 2022 reflected figures that showed 30% recovery, 30% of non-Chinese visitors versus three years earlier. And considering that the the borders were, you know, uh, the the ERFS system existed, but the borders were not completely open for one third of the month, I think that that is an incredible recovery. And it shows you how many people were just waiting to visit Japan uh, as soon as the government gave them any good news. I know that there was a a huge kind of um, TikTok and viral thing to be here, you know, on the first day uh, and to get your travel cred and kudos uh, for that reason. Um, but it's absolutely astonishing to me that we've been able to have uh, such a, a quick recovery. Uh, un- absolutely unbelievable. And I think it, that bodes very well for the rest of this year and then continuing uh, into into next year. Yes, indeed. I can say that a lot of people around me, uh, they were saying that uh, Japan was going to lose uh, a lot of uh, visitors, you know, because uh, it kept its borders closed for such a long time. But actually, it didn't happen. Everything was, uh, I mean, as you said, the first day on October the 11th, there were so many people actually coming in. So Right. I think that's a very interesting thing to to have brought up, the fact that there was a lot of commentary. And, you know, remember that commentary, people are paid to commentate. So there was a huge amount of commentary over the last three years about you know, given that Japan's borders have been closed for so long, you know, wh- whether this would have lasting damage to, you know, the image and perception of Japan. I think in certain areas, um, it it may have some impact, for example, uh, in the areas of education. You know, there were students who were intending to come in in 2020 who were not allowed to. They couldn't come in in 2021. And they couldn't come in in 2022. And, you know, I do know that some of them ended up looking elsewhere to, to basically get on with their lives and to study uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, like Korea probably benefited uh, from uh, from Japan's decision making. So it may be that in those areas, um, you know, that is the case. But I also think that people have short memories. And, you know, when when you're on holiday and when you're looking for somewhere to visit, then you're perhaps not so concerned about uh, the politics. You know, I mean, as it's the, the classic Simpsons quote, you know, statistics can be used to prove anything. You know, 27% of people know that. So we can pick and choose our stats about Japan. Um, you know, the fact that we have the highest number of single mothers in poverty of any G7 nation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, blah, you know, amnesty international levels of uh, criminal justice. Uh, but uh the point is, is as, as a traveler and as a tourist, you're probably not so concerned with these statistics. 
uh, and Japan's soft power around the world is huge um, with, uh, you know, uh, all the anime and manga and the video games and uh, various aspects of the culture, the food, uh, the sport uh, being very, very attractive to people. So uh, in terms of how demand has been impacted by Japan's uh, decisions over the last three years, I see very, very little. And in fact, in, in a bizarre way, and I hope nobody from the government is is hearing me because, uh, you know, I don't want to give them any ideas should a pandemic happen in future. But in a sense, it, it's created this pent up demand, which is which is now exploding. The biggest yeah, I, issue. I, I, I was sorry, actually going to say ahead. that. I was going to I was going to say that it's almost like Japan was playing hard to get. And so you want it even more now. Right. Right. It, 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 there is. Yeah. There is a uh, there is absolutely a bit of that. Um, then the, the question is, well, what are the constraints on capacity? Right. And, uh, you know, flights are going to be, I think, the biggest one, actually. Uh, but, you know, any rec recovery, recovery in travel uh, to any nation, it, it can only be as big as its, uh, its flight capacity. Uh, obviously, we had a lot of planes on the ground as a result decommissioned. We have staff shortages uh, on airlines. We have pilot shortages. Um, we have uh, fuel costs rising. Um, you know, booking a flight to Europe now, 50 percent is, is basically taxes and fees uh, of, of the ticket price. So we have a lot dragging down, you know, the potential for um, people to, to come back. Uh, so that, I think that for me is, is going to be the interesting thing is, is how quickly can uh, JAL and ANA and, and other airline providers get capacity back up to 2019 levels. Um, I think the earliest that that can really happen is probably, you know, to go back to full capacity. Speaking to some of my pilot friends, maybe two years at the absolute earliest. So, uh, you know, that that I think is going to be a, one constraint. Yeah, very good. So, yeah, Maya, did you have any uh, follow up uh, for Mac? Um, yeah. So, Mac, I I, I have uh, some uh, information. People in the industry they say that yes, probably the rebound, the full rebound, will be no earlier than uh, twenty twenty four. Some people are talking about twenty twenty five. I think that it depends on the country, of course. But yeah, um, I also hear that uh, a lot of. Um, uh, the air routes, they haven't been recovered yet. So uh, many of them uh, remain suspended. And uh, the question is, how soon the uh, the airlines will be able to actually um, restart or what's that, uh, get, get back to full operations? So once again, uh, I hate this expression, but uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. At the same time, uh, yes, at the same time, it's going to be, I think, especially for Japan, you know, uh, a very good journey from now on. Uh, the thing is that uh, maybe it will be good for Japan because with the number of uh, flights at the moment to and from uh, the country, obviously the, the air seats are limited. And if we have to be positive about this problem, I would say that scarcity usually creates value. So maybe we'll have even uh, more people willing to come to the country. Yeah, I, I think that's a, it's interesting, right? Uh, whether you think it's scarcity, whether you think that Japan has basically put a Ralph Lauren logo on its Uniqlo polo shirt. Um, oh, that's a good line. And I should write that down and use it, uh, use it more often. Um, you know, there's something is definitely uh, with us uh, in terms of uh, brand and in terms of people wanting to visit. Uh, it's also very interesting that this recovery is taking place without uh, Chinese visitors, or rather, I should say, specifically visitors coming from, um, you know, mainland China, uh, who are a huge part of, of travel in Japan. You know, the tourism boom from uh, 2011 to 2019 wouldn't have happened uh, without them and uh, that group of visitors and also their spending as well, which is which is huge. So, you know, it's interesting that even though we're having, you know, this this rebound, you are seeing uh, certain aspects of um, the market that have benefited from uh, Chinese visitors, for example, um, you know, luxury spending, not in accommodation, but in terms of goods uh, is uh, is down and has not seen a recovery in, in October. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is attributed to basically the lack of visitors from mainland China. So 
you know, it's the fact that we've got this kind of skewed uh, dynamic is uh, is leading to certain trends, certain aspects of tourism are, are benefiting, you know, and, and certain aspects are, are still yet to recover. Uh, the other thing, yes. uh, there's 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 a few other uh, aspects that uh, I think are interesting to discuss around uh, uh, this as well. Right. Um, one of them is just the overall staff shortage that uh, is existing. Um, uh, and I, I'm going to interpret staff shortage more broadly. OK, so, you know, uh, come 2019, you know, I was guiding around. Uh, I'll just use Tokyo as an example, which is my main base of operations, although I do guide around the country. I've actually just finished uh, two big tours where I've been hired by um, a larger business to, to guide uh, two very high profile groups uh, around uh, around Japan, so Naoshima, um, Kyoto, uh, Osaka, etc. And uh, but my main base of operations is Tokyo. And I can tell you that walking around the city, a lot of places that were kind of um, go to in terms of, uh, you know, restaurants and even tourist attractions themselves um, or, or just places that put tourist attractions sounds like bigger. Of course, what, what we do is primarily in neighborhoods that are typically not so visited. And a lot of places that I would be showing people uh, just don't exist anymore. And so, you know, that's unfortunately because a huge number of them went out of business over the last three years, uh, either because of a lack of uh, government support or because the support that they did receive was not enough. And the, 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 the lack of customers, meaning that business is deciding to throw it in. And some of them after, you know, uh, a long time, you know, we've had 100 and 200 year restaurants and accommodation services that are now no longer with us. And that has created also an interesting dynamic. You know, um, the guides that I'm talking to, again, guides who, who are still around. Um, some of them have retired over the last uh, uh, several uh, years, um, having to almost relearn the city, you know, and, and to uh, you know, rediscover uh, the interesting little off the beaten path uh, things which, which make... Um, a guy, you know, a tour, something that, you know, guiding isn't just about, you know, pointing at things and then and then moving on to the next spot. A good a good guide thinks very much about the construction of the day, the way that a good DJ should think about the construction of their DJ set, uh, that you have ups and, and downs, um, you, you know, periods of, of high intensity and then, and then periods for people to relax and, uh, you know, interspersement of, of information and the way that that's delivered. Um, and what you use is sort of talking points or teaching points as you navigate your way around the neighborhood or the city. And for these to have disappeared uh, has sort of given an interesting dynamic to, um, to to guiding as well. Also, the accommodation industries are suffering from staff shortages, uh, which is uh, causing a headache for my friends. I, I think some of them are on the call, actually. Uh, who are working within uh, hotels and ryokans, uh, as we've suddenly had this um, huge bounce back, uh, again, with only three weeks notice. So not enough time for uh, a lot of businesses that re rely much more on manpower to actually bounce back and, and be able to uh, to be in a good place to to handle this, uh, this demand. So I think that uh, that can play out in a number of ways. Um, uh, it's probably a good opportunity for people who have experience in hospitality to use this as an opportunity to come and, and, and move to, um, to Japan. Uh, if anybody is in that position out there, then I'd encourage you to look for job postings from some of the big uh, travel providers as well. It's also going to create employment opportunities um, here, uh, here domestically. Yeah, uh, interesting, Mac. M my son told me that he's also noticed a a big drop off in service at the restaurants that are still surviving um, because of the lack of wait staff. So right. it, it kind of tracks with what I've been hearing. Yeah, I've seen, I've experienced that as well, you know, and, and that's absolutely because, you know, restaurants are, you know, those that are still around are struggling to, to, to make ends meet. I mean, uh, it, the, the guys are already operating operating at super thin margins in in Tokyo, right? When you can get an incredible lunch and you look down at your plate and you're like, "How exactly has this been provided for one thousand yen?" Um, uh, in in the face as well of various inflationary factors that are hitting, um, you know, not just restaurants but industries all across Japan, uh, the the first variable cost that you're going to cut is your staff cost, and so where you may have had three uh, people in the past, you know, now you're down to one who's having to manage, you know, 20 tables 
Uh, and uh, that's definitely a trend that, that we're seeing uh, across the board. And wait till th- this next month. They're saying what the uh, electricity is going up 30 percent. Is that correct? Yeah, I've heard some horrific figures. Let's hope that they're not <laughs> they're not going to come to pass. And, you know, it's only 25 percent. But, yeah, it's uh, it, it's some we, we've got some tough times. The country's going to have to finally admit, I think, that we've found various ways right from any economists out there to to pretend that japan has not had inflation you know shrinkflation and all sorts of other uh, ways but yeah everything's going up right from from um, except unfortunately wages are not going up fast enough um you know your bottle of water in the conveni now is is and these are small things for small items these are small amounts of yen right but you know a bottle of suntory tenensui has gone up from you know 102 yen to 120 yen, and that's a 19 uh, or so 18 percent, 18 percent increase, right? That's that's a huge percentage cost rise on on some base products. So yeah, so you know tourism, and the other thing about the way that tourism works, which people forget, is that the rising tide does not float all ships. So, um, y- y- you know, typically you see tourist behavior not um is is a very interesting form it's not quite the what's the phrase that the trickle down economics you know which uh, we all know is absolute nonsense but certain people like to believe it exists but you know tourism is not the trickle down economics that everybody wants it to be and you don't just see it within one city and you know its impact on restaurants you actually see it you see it across the country right so in japan there is something known as the golden route and the golden route is basically Tokyo, Hakone, uh, Kyoto, maybe Osaka, and possibly you know Hiroshima, right? It's that Tokaido Shinkansen axis. Uh, get your rail pass, and you spend you know a week and a half here, two weeks maybe, and you you carve up your stop offs along that route, right? Now, uh, over the last, I would say, seven eight years, there's been a huge push to try to get people off the golden route. And this has uh, manifested itself in the form of government funding, uh, which comes out of the tax budget here and then is sent to various bodies, uh, either the JNTO or uh, prefectures or city authorities or town authorities. And then this this money is deployed to try to get people to to come and visit them. Uh, it, uh, more recently, this has been coached in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, phrases like that and also you know descriptions of over tourism kyoto you can't say the word kyoto in the media without some <laughs> line about it being uh over touristed which is uh, i don't know anyway we can i can express my thoughts about that later but it's it's one that people like to pull out uh uh to to uh to to talk about you know the the huge number of visitors remember I think in 2019, we had 58 million visitors to Kyoto. And given I've just told you that there were 31.8 billion visitors to the country in total, and not uh, not all of them are going to Kyoto, it does tell you that at least at least half of visitors to Kyoto are actually domestic travelers and domestic tourists. So, you know, uh, I would actually like to touch on this point just now, if you will. I was in Kyoto back in uh, earlier this year. and. Uh, I was walking around the world famous Arashiyama bamboo forest and something was very interesting to me. There was a lot of graffiti on the bamboo. Uh, I'm sure many, many of you have visited this and you've seen the ubiquitous green tape, which is often taped on top of this graffiti. But people go and they'll carve, uh, you know, Mac was here. Oh, no, I've just incriminated myself. Anyway, uh, Tim, Tim was here. I saw uh, into into the graffiti or whoever your your lover or your partner is um, and a little heart um, or whatever it is you want to write. And it was interesting to me that I saw I actually saw more graffiti than I've ever done in my many, many visits to the bamboo forest. And I took many photos of it. And given that the borders were closed at that time, then there is really only one group of people. Occam's razor will tell you that were culprits for this. Uh, but yes, anyway, I'll leave that one hanging and, uh, we can, we can move on. So is Kyoto over touristed? Well, yeah, it's possible it is, but it's certainly not all the fault of visitors from overseas. So anyway, there's this huge desire to get, um, 
visitors off the, the golden route in Japan. And there's a huge amount of money. And some companies, uh, some of you are connected to some of the, the individuals and companies on, on LinkedIn, are very, very good at finding ways to extract this money that, that, is, that is passing through the system, um, you know, in, in the form of consultation services or setting up what are called fan familiarization trips, which then, you know, uh, uh, people uh, go on uh, to, um, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to test out various itineraries, which these providers have also uh, been paid a huge amount of money to build. Um, so, you know, there's a whole industry uh, in Japan around trying to get people away from Tokyo and Kyoto. And I have very mixed views about uh, how it's delivered, uh, as you can tell from reading between the lines on some of my comments, and also uh, the efficacy of it. Um, because, you know, when people come to Japan, uh, by the way, a lot of these uh, are also focused very much on the Western market, despite Western tourism being actually a minority of those tourist numbers from 2019, there is actually a very disproportionate focus from the government in terms of uh, trying to attract more from it. And we can understand why, again, we don't have to spell out uh, too much, but there's a lot of geopolitics involved in these decision makings. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a disproportionate amount of resources trying to attract a minority who are perceived to be the kind of tourists that, that we want in Japan and to, uh, to who, who are going to, to be spending more. Although, again, the statistics show that that is not always the case. Um, but when, you know, when these people are coming to Japan, you know, the majority of my guests are coming to Japan and they are coming for one two week holiday. And although I, I'm very lucky to have a number of repeat visitors, the majority of them are coming as a trip of a lifetime. And so what that means is, is that let's say, you know, everybody on this call, I'm sure is familiar with the, the delights of Kyushu. I was last there in September, um, again, actually doing some tourism consulting work. And it's an absolutely fantastic part of the country. But the one of the things that you have to think about is, OK, how are we going to get more people coming from New York or London to visit Kyushu? And it's going to happen in one of three ways. Either uh, they're going to spend two weeks in Japan like they planned. Um, and instead of they're going to substitute right some of the days that they would have spent in Tokyo and Kyoto, and they're going to go down and spend them in Fukuoka and Ibuski Onsen. Uh, so that's one way. The second way is that they're going to extend their trip. So they're going to find out, you know, all of these YouTube videos that have been made at insane cost, uh, some of them very good, some lovely drone shots in there, uh, insane cost to ultimately the, the taxpayer, um, uh, showing, you know, the, the delights of uh, some random town in, in Hokkaido. People are going to watch that and they're going to go, oh, my God, I need to do my two weeks in Tokyo and Hakone and Kyoto and Osaka. And then I need to go and spend another week up, you know, where I saw this great YouTube video. And the third one is return visitors. So they're going to go, OK, we, 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 we come, we, we've come for this Golden Week trip for two weeks. And Japan is so great that we need to come back. Uh, and I've actually challenged wherever I go uh, and do any travel consulting, I always challenge the authorities. Uh, sometimes they don't want to hear anything because they're run by bureau. These businesses, you know, they, these uh, these uh, projects are run by bureaucrats who are going to be off to a different division um, in two months' time, and so their job is just to deploy the money. Uh, but where there are people who genuinely care about what they do, um, Kyushu is actually a good example. I challenge them to say, "Well, what is it that you want?" Because uh, you need to figure out how these people are going to get here. Whether it's going to be substitution, whether it's going to be extension, or whether it's going to be repeaters, and then. Uh, you're going to want to um, target your marketing in different ways. And typically what they say is they actually want people to extend their trip. They understand it is a big trip, but they want, the, they want people to uh, know that uh, there's so much to do in Japan that covering it in two weeks is not enough. Uh, because if you ask people to come back to this country, then the, you know, the opportunity cost of coming back to Japan is that you could be going to the Taj Mahal, you could be going to the pyramids, you could be going to the Great Barrier Reef or Machu Picchu, or anywhere else on earth that's uh, that's tough competition so the key is while people are here to try to to get them to stay longer and so one of the statistics that i'm going to be monitoring um a lot in 2023 um is trip length trip length is going to be 
uh, the biggest determiner of whether this absolutely insane amount of money um, that uh, uh, has been spent over the last decade trying to persuade people to visit, uh, you know, random non-Tokyo, non-Kyoto parts of Japan has been successful. Uh, I suspect I'll be one of the few people monitoring this statistic. I suspect the government doesn't care. They'll just care about visitor numbers. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's going to be very interesting. Yeah, that's that's good to hear from you because uh, I also know that uh, up until 2019, there was a lot of criticism uh well, about the topics, actually, or the points you mentioned just now. And uh, so I also have heard that the JNTO at that time was actually preparing plans, you know, to disperse the, the foreign visitors uh, to different parts of the country. Of course, I don't know the details of that. Uh, they have had two and a half years to work on those plans and eventually start to implement them. But as you say, yes, uh, marketing, how you market uh, uh, the destinations, how you market Japan and to whom you market uh, it are very, very different, you know, from uh, what we have seen, uh, let's say, the state authorities do before. And at the end of the day, I believe that even though uh, many people say that this is, uh, you know, the job of the state, eventually the local authorities will have to, you know, take responsibility for that and go out and, uh, you know, start uh, doing the marketing themselves. Because, uh, as you say, the state government, the central government, they do care about the numbers, not so much about other things, though. Yeah, yeah, Maya, you're absolutely right. You know, we know this, right, that the, um, the, the basic target has been, had, was 40 million visitors by 2020, right, yes, for the Olympic yes. year. Yes, yeah. And then 60 million was being floated around for 2030. Yes, it's still there, um, actually, that target. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, and, and actually, you know, it's funny. I, I just saw a comment uh, in the chat uh, that said that uh, the only people upset about tourism is uh, 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 foreigners. I do find that very amusing, by the way, that there was a, uh, a lot of comments on LinkedIn about the borders opening. And then I guess foreign residents thinking, oh, you know, it was so nice not to have visitors here. I guess maybe they were people who were able to pay their mortgages, uh, regardless of whether tourists came in or not. Um, I, I find it's a very, very weird thing, uh, the protectionism that takes place. Um, you know, there are reasons why everybody wants to visit the Eiffel Tower. Right. And so I, I really smack. I, I, it doesn't sit well with me when people talk about uh, over tourism because it, it, talk, it often it's connected with concepts of protectionism. Um, and then people also talk about, for example, raising ticket prices as a way to control entry into World Heritage sites that that uh, again, I don't like it because you can see that it's very politically motivated. It's often very racially motivated as well. And those kind of comments don't uh, don't sit very well with me and they don't sit very well with the government who <laughs> they only care uh, about the number of, uh, of visitors. That's been the target. And so, um, you know, th those numbers will not be reached without, for example, um, Chinese visitors uh, and the Chinese border policy on their end changing and then Chinese visitors coming back to Japan. Um, but but. I, we know that something has changed over the last three years, and that is that sustainability has become far more of a buzzword. And so how, you know, how much that plays in to, you know, the, it's already playing into lip service. Uh, how much does that play into actual policy? Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I, I, my, my, if I had to make a prediction now, I would actually say very, very little. Right. Yes, I agree with you on that. And just going back to your point about uh, over tourism, I think that just like you, you know, it's it's people loved that buzzword because it made them feel righteous, you know, and virtuous and whatever you say. But at the end of the day, it was not really about over tourism. It was or it was not about numbers that couldn't uh, be accepted. It was about management. And the thing is that a lot of uh, countries, I mean, Japan is among them, of course, a, a lot of local authorities, they were not prepared actually to manage the tourist flows. And that's the only problem they had. The problem was not the number of people uh, who, you know, who visited different destinations or so. Uh, but blaming yeah. it on over, over tourism, you know, just um, <laughs> as a way to uh, avoid responsibility is indeed a very, very uh, convenient 
Yeah, you, I mean, you, you are absolutely right. You know, the, the, the world is not overpopulated, right? The world just has incredibly bad politically and racially driven resource allocation, right? So, right, yes. You know, I, what, what, you know, I have never visited anywhere here and thought that it is over-touristed. It's just that the, the, the flow of people could potentially be better managed, Indeed. you know, yes. to to not to not concentrate it in in certain areas but in in some cases that is unavoidable right i mean you know who the main entry into um uh sensoji temple in northeast tokyo which is i've read in various places the most visited religious site on earth uh, it's at least at the very least one of the most visited religious sites on earth you know the main entry to that is a narrow street that has been around for several hundred years you know nakamisa dori right is, and yes. <laughs> um you're gonna you know people have to tolerate the fact that if they want to visit then other people want to other people want to visit too um uh and tokyo is a big enough city i just again i think that uh this is actually the fault often of some of the big providers when i look at the itineraries that they're that they're sending people on you know it's very concentrated around arguably not necessarily what what many people would consider to be the best things to see but it's very concentrated around you know convenience of getting them there on a big coach which uh having guided you know a uh, uh, large group tours uh, from a big coach you know this, this is something else that this country is not really set up for you know um trying to navigate you know huge coaches around higashiyama and kyoto or other areas you know uh, even in tokyo you know if you want to visit um uh, unfortunately, I, I can't talk. Uh, I can't mention any names. But anyway, there are certain exclusive er uh, pl things to visit in, for example, Hiro. And, you know, the, co the closest place to park, to park a big coach to them is about 10 minutes walk away. So it's, uh, um, you know, very, very interesting uh, that, uh, you know, it's about really tourism management than it is about uh, controlling numbers. Yeah, once again, that well, sustainability should be actually. You can't be sustainable if you really set your manage, manage, management systems uh, in order. And uh, yeah, send people or just make people more tolerant of what it, what there is and what how the situation is. However, so um, I can see a couple of comments in the in the, the room chat. So uh, of course, anybody, if you want to join us here up on stage and talk with Mac and uh, share your opinions. Just raise your hand and we'll bring you up here. Um, yeah. Can I jump in just for a second, Maya? Sure. Okay. Yes. So I'll start with an anecdote and then I'll ask a couple of questions. So personally, um, you know, as somebody who intended to travel to Hawaii twice a year when I moved back here, due to the surcharges and other factors, you know, the whole COVID protocols that are still kind of, you know, in the works and you got to jump through hoops. My wife and I have gotten to the point where we're saying, you know what, it's just easier if we uh, shift our priorities and travel within Japan, um, because there there are a lot of places that we haven't been. And right. I'm wondering, uh, you know, first of all, I don't know what the percentage of GDP of travel of locals is, but but is there, do you see a shift, um, you know, a substantial shift that uh, the locals are filling up? part of that and you know do do you think that um that will make up for some of the capacity issues or overflow things um because i feel like here in atami somebody made a a comment that atami wants more people and yet atami doesn't really seem to have the will to update our infrastructure <laughs> you know i i feel like uh sometimes our hotels are full and uh, friends who want to stay here on a certain weekend when they're doing fireworks can't get a hotel or, or even a drive right. on you know so, so that that's something that ties in tim very nicely to the comments i made about you know trying to get people away from the golden route the reason why the golden route is so uh popular is that the infrastructure is there Right. I mean, and, you know, from from top level, from the Shinkansen, from the Tokaido Shinkansen, you know, all the way down uh, to, you know, the Tokyo subway. Right. So macro and micro level. Um, it's incredible the impact that just extending the Shinkansen uh, um, uh, to all the way to Kanazawa. Uh, had on that city and its tourism absolutely incredible right and it basically shaved off you know an hour's travel time versus the limited express that used to run that you would have to change to um so infrastructure is huge and what i found when i've done a lot of tourism consulting projects is 
these these cities you know they want to attract the visitors i mean atami is a good example i've actually done a bit of work down there but they do not want to or maybe do not have the ability uh to change the things that would make the location uh something that that would be able to attract more visitors i was down in kyoto uh, uh staying at, at one of the very famous large hotels there and they were full uh, as a result they couldn't help us move their group check-in earlier and when i asked why they told me that they were at 100 percent capacity and this 100 percent capacity was not driven by overseas tourism it was driven by the restart of the government subsidized domestic travel campaign which previously was called go to travel and uh now uh, has an even more ridiculous name uh but yeah it's actually uh you know uh, right now the reason why it's difficult to get a hotel room uh is often not because overseas tourism has restarted but actually that domestic uh res you know uh residents and citizens are being paid to travel yes Make, it makes sense do you do you see a trend with the japanese uh, fewer japanese going overseas and reallocating their their yen to travel within japan you know putting aside the incentives that the government's offering i don't see that that might be something that happens in the short term uh but i i don't see that as being a, a sustainable long-term trend just look at the you know the nhk right proudly parading the the on tv remember during golden week the people going to hawaii from here um without any irony that of course people from hawaii were unable to come into japan uh, at that time uh but yes uh it, i don't see it tim as being a, a, a long term trend yes but we also need to acknowledge the fact that before the pandemic domestic travel was actually uh the largest part of uh, tourism as a whole you know of the industry here in japan because number 1 was domestic travel number 2 was inbound and number 3 was outbound so that's probably, I mean, yeah, um, I for sure, I think that uh, it's going to to be the same, maybe in even, even when, you know, uh, the inbound tourist numbers are back. So right. things are not going to change that easily. The thing is that uh, it's probably domestic travel is probably going to increase because we have a growing population of uh, retired people and those people have the resources still. They are, you know, belong to the generations that have the financial and tam- time resources to um, allocate to to travel within the country. And we right. know that only fourteen percent of the Japanese actually travel abroad. So the rest of the population feels comfortable going places here in Japan domestically. Yeah. So it, well. it, you know, it, it's funny. I think there, there are certain nations that actually get a lot of stick for. Um, you know low percentages of passport ownership um well japan is right japan. but actually you know you 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 the numbers you've you've given us Maya, i think are really interesting right um in in japan it, there's there's a there is a big focus i guess to, you know just from a mathematical perspective i think you're right as a, we see the deployment of more uh travel dollars from the aging pop you know the population aging um I think that that naturally means that there will be an increase maybe in domestic travel but it will also have there'll also be the same rise percentage wise in outbound travel I think you know I don't think I I don't see like within individual people's decision making um you know that that reside here uh, a greater shift domestic versus overseas but Probably we'll we'll, we'll, we'll see you're right yes I think that you're right about that yeah we'll see we just need to watch the numbers once again. <laughs> right. Great. So, Mac, uh, it's nine o'clock almost. And, uh, well, it's time for us to uh, let people go uh, because, of course, it's uh, Wednesday morning. So thank you very much for this. It was a great conversation. Um, to anybody who is willing to join similar conversations uh, in the future, you can let us know uh, via, uh, well, the, the chat room here or on LinkedIn or any other uh, social media platform. If you haven't connected with uh, Mac yet, please do that. You can find him on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and I guess also on Pinterest. Mac? No, 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 don't worry about it. Nobody needs to follow me on Pinterest. Okay, (laughs) all right. But the rest of them, yes, I I am indeed on almost every social media platform, both 
as uh, Maction Planet, which is my travel business, and also as Kanpai Planet, uh, Kanpai, K-K-A-N-P-A-I, uh, Planet, where I focus on uh, Japan's drinks. So talking about Japanese whiskey, Japanese sake, shochu, and much more. Yeah, a lot of great great content there as well. And uh, of course, if you have friends coming uh, to Japan on uh, on holidays or for business, and if they need a, a guide, think about Mac because uh, he is one of the greatest guides you can find here in, in Tokyo, in Japan as well. So that's it for today. Thank you very much again to everybody who joined us and stayed with us here. Uh, we're looking forward to having you again next Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock and uh, have a great day. Thank you for tuning in today. We will be on air next week on Wednesday at 8 a.m. Japan time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn or Twitter. Again, we are looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and make the best of the day. See you!